Hi, everyone. Welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live video cast where we talk with people from all walks of the publishing industry. I'm Christy Stratus, historical suspense and historical fantasy author, and my awesome co-hosts are epic fantasy author Richard H. Stevens and sci-fi author David Kelly. Lurking for Legends is an interactive broadcast, and we encourage viewers to chime in with questions for our guests or comment on anything you hear in the show. And tonight is our much anticipated live read. This is our favorite episode. It seems to be a fan favorite as well. So we're super excited to introduce to our stream, David Payne, and he is a multi-genre author and writing sprint streamer, among other things. <laughs> welcome, David. Hi, thank you. Yes, welcome, David. It's great hey, to have you here. It's great to be here. I've been looking forward to this uh... Well, probably since the day you mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I was excited to see which piece you would you would pick too, because um, uh, you know, well, we'll talk about David's stream in a minute, but I know he has a lot of writing that he's done, so <laughs> I was really interested. So we're gonna start out just by sharing, you know, what we've been up to lately. Um, how about uh, David? Do you want to, uh, David Kelly? Do you want to go first? Um, as the um... Resident uh, non talker, I'll go first here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't really been doing much apart from editing and uh, writing. Um, I'm kind of a little bit behind on my editing because I need to get it finished so that my first reader can read it while she's available over Christmas. <laughs> so I've kind of like switched almost full time to uh, editing at the moment and uh, in a an attempt to try and catch up a little bit, but that's about it, really. I don't like talking about what I do while I'm doing it. It's like, read it at the end, that's fine. You know? <laughs> I can understand. Check out the results. Don't worry about the process. <laughs> Richard, how about you? What have you been doing? Yeah, no, I've been uh, slowly working away at uh, When Legends Rise, this book four in the Highcliffe Guardian series. And, uh, I've been so busy uh, doing uh, book signings every weekend. Uh, I did uh, supposed to do three last weekend, but uh, we had such high winds that uh, we didn't go on Saturday. We we're afraid that our tent wouldn't survive, so we missed Saturday. We did Friday and uh, Sunday. Everything went well. I got some bunch of new readers and some return readers, so it was great. And uh, we got another one coming up this weekend. It's called the Cambridge Christmas Market. So if you're in the Waterloo region uh, in southern Ontario, we'll be at the Art Center in downtown Cambridge. So come out and see us on Saturday or Sunday. Uh, Think it's free to get in i'm not sure but i believe it is so uh, just uh, you can google that uh, that's about what, what's new with me and uh getting ready for this live read and just so people know uh, we do have a another uh, reader uh, paula jones uh she is not here at the moment if she shows up uh, we'll bring her in and uh, we'll introduce her if she doesn't we're going to go ahead and read her story anyway for her so just bear with us uh, as we go and how about you david payne what's uh new with you <laughs> Uh, well, this year has been kind of a, an interesting journey. Uh, I've been writing up a storm, as, as Christy mentioned. I, I do writing sprints every day on my stream uh, on Twitch. Um, over the course of a year, I've written like, I don't know, 80 some odd short stories among, uh, I don't know, six or seven novel length works. Um, the piece that I'm reading tonight is, is a story I wrote back in December last year. Um, but it's been through a few few hurdles to get here. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, I guess the most recent news, which I wasn't able to share on my stream this morning because it didn't come in. Um, but just after I finished streaming this morning, I got word that one of my stories has been accepted. Uh, so officially, that is my first uh, my first story to be purchased. So Big congratulations. Very, How very excited about it. That's great. Yeah. Impeccable timing on the on their part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I just heard something from Paula. Um, I hopefully I'll be able to get in in a second. Hey, awesome. Okay. Yep. Cool. In the meantime, I will share what's up with me. So, this week, um, in Corrupted Magic, which is on Kindle, Vela, and Patreon. Uh, we published episode 20. We, I published episode 20. And um, that is called Preparing for the Worst. And at this time in the story, uh, unbeknownst to Dark Acts, Knox is choosing whether to let someone take his place to die while the rest of the group prepares to rescue Gertrude from Grimoire Assassins. So that is that last part has been going on since the very beginning. You guys probably remember those of you who are reading it right now. So if you haven't read it yet, plenty of time to catch up. 
I am currently writing episode 29, so I'm like nine weeks ahead. Um, and in other news, my final NaNoWriMo count was 28,776 words, which for me is a huge win. Um, I think David wrote like 80 something thousand words, but for, uh, that's like an average month for him. It seems, I don't know how you do it, David. <laughs> uh, to be fair, the, the nano story itself is only 53,000, but, oh, um, <laughs> the other 30,000 was working on other things for the rest of the month. <laughs> 80,000 words in a month. I must've missed that. I was busy uh, dealing with the, the comments on the side. That's awesome. Congratulations. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's a ton. It's a ton. So he aims really high. When you join his writing sprints, you'll see his word count up there. And it's usually like, I think it's usually like 80,000 words, isn't it? Uh, over the course of a month, it's 80, 85,000 words. Um, wow. this, this year, I had a goal of writing a million words. Um, I, I <laughs> had been not, <laughs> well, you have to understand, I wasn't writing for like eight years, seven years, something like that. And uh I came back last November and said, okay, I'm going to start writing. And then I had such a good time with it. Uh, I wrote again in December and then in mid December, I'm like, ah, let's write a million words and see how it goes. Um, and it was always with the idea that if I failed, that's okay. Yeah. That's um, great. I really just wanted to get into the daily habit of writing. Um, I think I've established that I've been able to do that. So, uh, congratulations to me as far as that goes, but, you know, next year is all about, you know, polishing things up and actually getting stuff out there now that I have a, a, a bit of a catalog uh, to put out. So, yeah. And that mindset is probably a really that relaxed mindset probably helps a lot because a lot of us stress about how many words we're going to fit in. And you're just like, you know, just a million for a year. Yeah, you know, it's, it's not probably a key. <laughs> it's yeah. Just. It's funny, what, why do we worry about? The amount of words. I um, mean, it just seems such a strange thing to worry about, and yet, and yet we all kind of do it. It's, it's, a, it's a weird thing. Yeah, it, it, different people worry. But I don't. I don't. I can't say I so much personally worry about it. Just you know that it's long enough to be a novel, pretty much for me. But I do know there are people out there who um, really go by word count heavily. So I guess it's those people. I mean, this this year wasn't an aberration as far as that goes. Uh, I think next year you'll see you'll still see some word counts going up, but uh, most of the time I'm going to be focusing on cleaning up what I've already written um, and and getting it out there. And uh, you know, this year was also a lot of exploration for myself because I'd always considered myself a fantasy author, um, and I wanted to just see what else I could do, just because as far as I was concerned, it wasn't working for me before. So let's, let's start exploring and what can work now. Um, and I found, you know, quite a, quite a few different areas that I felt uh, worked really well. So that's great. Yeah. Fantastic. So tonight we're going to be reading, um, a work from Richard, a work from David Payne and a work from Paula Jones. And I think pa Paula might just be popping in now. So yeah. Paula, we see you back there and we're just about to add you. Everyone's at trying to add you. We're very excited. <laughs> Hi, Paula. <laughs> Welcome to the show. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm so Hi, sorry Paula. that I'm late. <laughs> Don't, worry. Don't worry at all. Really not a big deal. These things can't be helped sometimes. I know. So why don't you, not to throw you on the spot, but why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Basically, Here, what thank you, you for right? having me. Oh, absolutely. There might be yes. a delay. Yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself, Paula, before we get going. Uh, we've all uh, introduced ourselves. So give us a little introduction of Paula Jones and what you write. OK. Um, well, I have 88. <laughs> A writer, so I write a lot of, um, uh, I guess, oh Lord, I write a lot of young adult books. Um, uh, and I also write, um, the, well, the book that I'm going to read tonight, it's a parody action series. It comes from when I um, was briefly obsessed with Jack Reacher books. <laughs> and as much as I love them, I would also in my head 
and think no human can actually do things. And so I decided to write a parody of, of the Jack Reacher series. <laughs> so it that's what that is. I love that. That's great. <laughs> no, <it's>, um, <laughs> So just so you know, Paula, we discussed this uh, before we came on air, that uh, we're going to be reading from David Payne first, and then you, and then mine will be last. Mm -hmm. just so, so if you want to organize your computer or whatever, just so you're up to speed. Yeah. And so are you guys ready? You want to jump right into the first live read and see how it goes? Or Yeah, why go? not? Why not? I'm just yeah. going to throw out there that, that um, Paula's being very, very humble. She's actually a multi-genre, and she writes for many age groups as well. She writes for adults, YA, she writes middle grade. So there is quite a lot, you know, in her repertoire for you to pick for mm -hmm. from. So I just wanted to let you guys know that before we begin. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so David Payne will let you uh, set your story up and uh, introduce uh, the viewers to the cast of characters in the scene. And then uh, we'll just jump right into it. Sure thing. All right, so we're going to be reading from chapter four of my story, Fish. Um, as I've mentioned before, this is not a published story. It is just a uh, story that I'm continuously working on. Uh, so we have the character of Torin, who will be re read by Richard. Uh, he is the son of Captain Anders. He's a fisherman, uh, hates fishing, uh, and is around 16 years old. Uh, Christy will be reading the part of Alar, who is the daughter of Drenis, who is uh, the the uh, healer of the village that they're from. Uh, she is also around 16 and she's got a bit of a chip on her shoulder. Uh, Paula will be reading the part of Captain Anders, who is uh, Torin's father. Uh, seasoned captain also happens to be one of the village elders. And then uh, this scene also has a number of other uh, captains of various fishing boats uh, within the village. Uh, so David Kelly will be reading the parts of those various captains and also the one other village elder who happens to have one line in this scene. Uh, to set the scene, uh, we're in the village of Qual. It's one of many small villages on the perimeter of a large lake and a valley. Uh, the small communities are represented by Lord Drac, who occupies a castle nearby. All the villages supply tax to the Lord in the form of farmed food, fish, and mined ore. This isn't really a, a community where coin is spread uh, by any means. In the opening chapters, Alar, the daughter of the village he healer, helps treat a woman who is infected with something she and her father have never seen. He treats it like any other rash, but Alar wants to find out what else might be going on and investigates. She, in she discovers hundreds of strange worms on the lake shore and sought out the aid of the fishers in town. The scene opens with Alar in Torin, approaching Torin's family home uh, where he knows all the captains are meeting because they had a particularly bad day of fishing. And that's where we start. Fantastic. So here we go. Torin, still holding the vial of worms, took Alar up to his house. As they approached, Alar could see it was brightly lit inside from multiple lamps and candles, and it bustled with activity, almost alive in the way the light flickered. The village is going to have trouble if we can't get more fish in the traps, Torin said as they walked up the hill. We barely had enough to support our own family today. If the counts are bad tomorrow, it is likely that the boat hands will get the next cut. That will leave very little for anyone else. But we have fish stored, right? That's why we fish as long as the lake isn't frozen, right? Alar said. <laughs> yes, but if we don't store enough, we won't have enough to last us through the winter. Alar pondered on this as they got to Torn's door. Inside, she could hear a bunch of voices. Most were talking over one another, and there might have been three or four con different conversations at once. Around the corner of the house, in the waning light of third quarter, Alar saw, the, saw two kids playing in the dirt. They looked happy, oblivious to the worries of the adults inside. Small blessings, she thought. Torin opened the door. Through the maw of the door, a waft of heavy sweat poured out onto Alar. Her eyes widened at the smell, but she caught herself before making some comment about it. At the opening of the door, half of the conversations died out immediately as the people inside turned to look at her and Torin. The other half slowly did the same, except for one exuberant explainer who needed to get in his last word. Been saying for years, tis the work of the Lord. 
threat be damned. Alara scanned the room, spotting Reaver, the farrier and a village elder, and others she recognized as fishers, but none of them by name. Reaver sat in one of two chairs. The other was taken by a broad man with a thick beard that was graying and scraggled. He looked over Torin and Alar and smiled appraisingly. Torin, come in and bring your woman as well. We'll be out of the way. Torin immediately flushed, and it took Alar a moment to piece together what the man had said and what it meant. No! She exclaimed defensively. That's not why I'm here. At the same time, Torin stammered, Oh, that's, is that me? Richard, you're on mute. Oh. <laughs> I'm really stammering. She, she, she has an idea about the fish. The laughter that flooded the room took Alar off guard. She shrunk back from it, remembering the time before she had learned her father's skills, where children would disparage her for having a deformed arm. Looking at the assembled group, she saw several of them looking at her left arm like it was a badge, telling them that she should be laughed at, disrespected. She closed her eyes, swallowed, and tucked the embarrassment away. Stepping forward again, she spoke over the laughter. There's something wrong with the lake. I've come to ask you all some questions about it. The laughter died down and the room became quiet with it. Torin took the vial to the man who had spoken. Dad, she found these in the lake by the irrigation. Have you seen anything like them? The man looked dubiously at his son, but took the vial up and shook it around a little. He set it down on the table in front of him. Looks like, um, looks like bait to me. Why would worms be a problem? Because there are hundreds of them on the shore. Because touching them causes an intensely painful rash. This caught the attention of both seated men. Dor Torin's father picked up the vial again and took a look. One of the other men in the room took it from him and they all shared it around. None of them looked like they had seen anything like them before. Alar was dismayed by this, but still determined to find answers. He, Torin tells me that your accounts were off today. Alar started. David is refreshing. <laughs> I'll continue. Alar started. Can you tell me if that is just today or if it has been going on for some time? Andrew stared at his son and Alar saw Torin flinch under the, under the gaze. We don't normally talk about the counts with people, but yes, the counts were off today. And when we looked back, they've been going down a little each day for a while. Today was a big drop though. We had less than 100 fish total. Alar thought that number seemed large, but she didn't question it. Worse, most of the fish that were in our nets were small, too small to take back and eat, so those had to be tossed back. More work for, for fewer fish is always a bad day. Torin and I, we set down an extra net for tomorrow. Did you see anything wrong with the fish? The captains all exchanged looks with each other, but none of them were offering anything more. Torin coughed once, then spoke up. <clears throat> uh, their organs are all miscolored like they had eaten something. But they are safe to eat, for sure. One of the captains said defensively. How do you know that? Alara retorted. I just treated someone today who was covered head to toe in pox, all from coming in contact with these worms. If there are infected fish and people eat them, I can't imagine how much worse that could be. The captain shrunk back into the back uh, of the assembled group. Torin's father held out his hand, palm down, as if telling the other captains to settle down and be quiet. He's clearly the one in charge of the other captains. Alar thought. We don't know, but we haven't distributed any of the latest catch either. I don't want to toss at all, but we don't want to cause everyone to get sick either. What would you have us do? I don't know yet. This only came to me today. I only found these worms by chance. Can you show me the fish? Anders nodded at Torin, who went into the back room. He came back with a plate and a fish com covered completely with salt. He placed it on, a ta on the table, using a knife to brush away most of the salt. 
and to pull back the opening that they they had made to gut the fish the inside of the fish was all red as you can see very red inside Torin said indicating it with his fingers and careful not to touch it himself and that's not normal not at all and this was the first day they looked different Anders looked around one of the captains looked up sheepishly he was a short man with a hooked nose, and Alara thought he looked a little like an imp from the stories when she was younger. His voice was grating, gravelly. I ain't seen them change for weeks. Didn't say nothing because couldn't do nothing about it. He shrugged. Not apologetic, just a matter of fact. None got hurt or nothing. Wasn't worried. Alara tried to hide her frustration. Clearly that captain was bred from the same stock as my father. Don't ask questions, just do what you've always done. Has anyone reported any skin irritation from touching the fish or their innards? She asked. Not that I'm aware of. Torin's father looked around at the captains in case any of them had heard differently. One screwed his mouth up, blinked, looked at Anders and then back at Alar. Had a deck and said he couldn't work the other day. Hands hurt, he said. Who? Where do they live? Alar asked, but before the captain could respond, another spoke up. I saw my deck on scratching the other day. Could that be something, too? It might be. I need to see them immediately. It's late. No sense in disturbing people at the end of the day, is there? Before Alar could answer, rage fueling her thoughts, Torin spoke up. If they're out there and have this affecting them, Torin indicated the fish on the table. Then Alar needs to know now. Anders pursed his lips, then nodded. Bring your crew here. We'll get them all looked at. All at once, the other captains headed out of the house. Reber stood and offered Alar his seat. Alar took the, shook the offer away. She had too much on her mind to sit. You're Drenis's daughter. Anders asked as Reber sat back down. Alar nodded. Good healer he is. Good mentor for you, I bet. It would do no good to air out her grievances about her father, so Alar just nodded again. Torin took back the vial of worms and looked at them more closely. Where do you suppose they came from? He asked. Alar, uh, Anders grunted. Mm. Doesn't much matter where they came from. The real question is how to stop them now that they're here. They were on the shore. What about in our well? So far, it seems like our well is fine. We used water from it to treat the women who had the rash and it seemed to have helped. Just washing away the infected areas. Still, best not to come in contact with the worms at all, if you can help it. So what should we do with these fish then? Are they all like this? The ones you caught today, the last few days? Anders nodded. Maybe not all of them, but yes. Alara's eyes rested on the fish. What happens if we just stop fishing? Stop fishing. The words came from behind her. It was one of the captains returning from with his deck hands. Never mind what you heard, Roddick. These your hands? Captain Roddick led in two men, both in their graying years. Have you noticed anything unusual about your skin? Any itching, discomfort, anything out of the ordinary otherwise? The man on the left shook his head, but the other rolled up his sleeves. This here being powerful itching. Last quarter, it be hurting too. Let me have a look. Captain, bring that lamp over here, please. It was Torin who grabbed the lantern, she indicated, and brought it over. With the flickering of its light, it was difficult to be certain, but she didn't see any pox on the skin. But it was splotchy, discolored. When did it start itching? She asked, taking a look at the man's other arm. This morning, maybe. Round first quote. Okay. Take him to the well, wash the arm thoroughly, and let's check back on the morning. Alara turned her attention back to the other man. And nothing wrong for you? If anything changes, let me know immediately. Alara saw the rest of the fishers and their crew, one by one as they came in. All told, more than a dozen had some signs of the rash, though none as serious as Gior. Still, a dozen more cases seemed already a huge problem. I'll take the seat now, if you don't mind. 
she said to Reber, who had sat quietly through it all. To his credit, he stood, and she collapsed into the chair without any more life in her legs. Now that all the other captains were gone, Anders rested his hands, palm down on the table. So what do you want us to do? Just stop fishing? Alara thought there was a hint of desperation in his voice, and she could see the tenseness in his hands. His knuckles were white. I don't know. I wish I could say for sure, but right now it just doesn't seem safe. Reber, who had been silent for most of the night, took the moment to speak up. We need to know how bad this is, Anders. How many fish are compromised? Anders nodded. It'll be a lean winter, that's for sure. Too late to get what we sent what we sent to Lord Drac back too, I expect. What if we went up river? Torin said. Both of the elder men turned their gaze upon him. Torin stepped forward. If the worms are in the lake, they might not be in the river. Maybe the fish will be clean up there. Anders smiled. Not a bad idea. We won't be able to, to do the volume, but we aren't getting it out of the boats anyway. <laughs> That's intriguing. There's a lot to wonder about there. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Richard's eating the worms. <laughs> oh, you're not supposed to eat the oh. worms. <laughs> that was great. I feel the itchy now after reading that. <laughs> like, Don't you? Yeah. It's like <laughs> <laughs> you feel like itching, do you? That was good. <laughs> Thank you, David. It was good. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, it was good. So Paula Jones, uh, yours is called Heat, and I, I love, like, other people, uh, the viewers can't see this, but we get these sheets that are sent uh, around to all of us, and uh, it says uh, who is the reader and what the, what character they're reading, and Christy is Christy Alley, and actually that's kind of uh, ironic uh, in a, a sad kind of way. I think Christy Alley just passed away this week. Yeah, Christy Alley, that's right. I, I just, it just thought <laughs> yeah. of me there, but I saw Christy Alley earlier, and I go, well, this is not neat, it's Christy Alley, but uh, yeah. We lost Christy Alley this week, so that's kind of a sad thing. But uh, it, it just it struck me as uh, neat when I saw Christy Alley there. And that means absolutely nothing to yeah. our viewers. You can see the <laughs> anyway, you go ahead, Paula, and uh, describe your story. Uh, set us up and let us know who's reading and give us a scene. Sure. Okay. Now, this was a very random scene. Don't know why I chose this one. <laughs> it might be a little <laughs> boring to be honest, but um, okay. So this man, uh, Pete Strong, he was a former CIA agent or so he believes. And he has retired in Louisiana for some strange reason. Um, but he just wants to basically watch um, daytime television all day and do nothing. But then he meets this uh, detective or this private eye tracks him down and says, hey, I have a case for you. This famous Olympian has gone missing and you're the only person who can find him. So Pete Strong, who has this huge ego, but who is also very, very dumb. He's just not a smart man. Um, he takes Let's the take case. Casting, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> no. Let's stand for it. But um, and and in this, we'll meet Pete when he is on an airplane headed to um California, which is where the Olympian went missing. Also, Pete has just broken up with his girlfriend in Louisiana, and he doesn't realize that he's in love with her. So that will come into the, the scene a little bit. That's Great. it. Okay. Okay. Oh, do I have to say anything else? Do I have to start reading? I think David's the narrator, right, David Kelly? I'm at the beginning. Okay. So we're- Just one question, Paula, which part are you? I didn't put myself in because I didn't, I don't think oh, okay. I have enough parts. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, we, we should have included yourself for sure. It's your story. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey, 
it, that's it's fine if you want us to read it we'll absolutely read it we have no problem doing that you can sit back and uh, just like it, watching an audio book <laughs> okay okay <laughs> without the quality <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, yeah we might not make the audible uh cut that's for sure okay everybody ready yeah i just gotta finish my worm <laughs> April's laugh was somewhere between the sound of a hyena sneeze <laughs> and a screaming duck. In fact, one time as they'd been walking hand in hand near a lake watching the ducks float by, quack, quack, Strong had quietly made a joke and April's laughter sent the ducks into a panic. <laughs> Shrieking and nearly stampeding each other in their attempt to leave the water. The confused birds had mistaken April's laughter for the sound of a fellow duck screaming in fear. As the memory came to mind, Strong lost his grip. He silently chided himself for thinking of April again. Are you okay? The woman beside him asked, her soft brown eyes full of concern. Strong nodded. Sorry, I, it just your laugh, it reminds me of someone else's. It's very similar. Oh. The woman nodded knowingly. A former girlfriend or a wife? Strong hesitated. Uh, a cocktail waitress. The woman smiled. I understand. We all have one of those. Mine was a bartender just down the street from the news station where I work. That's what I do, by the way. I'm a reporter. Hmm. Anyway, I used to go to that bar nearly every day after work, and before I knew it, my favorite bartender ended up becoming my favorite person, and boundaries I didn't mean to cross or cross. And then the phone rang. <laughs> <laughs> Strong took another look at his pretty seatmate. Even though she was a woman, she seemed to understand the need for boundaries. Interesting. He wondered just how much she'd be able to relate to him if he explained his confusion about April. The woman smiled and gave Strong's arm a gentle pat. Don't worry, it gets better. Strong nodded and said nothing, an unexpected wave of shyness suddenly overtaking him. It would be weird to talk about April with a stranger. Besides, why waste of time mulling over the past when he was sitting right here with a beautiful woman only inches away? Strong pulled himself together and offered her hand to shake. I'm James Bond from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She laughed as she took his hand. Strong wind. What? James Bond? She arched a perfectly groomed eyebrow. Really? Really? Okay. Wow. Cool name. She gestured to, her, gestured to herself. <laughs> I'm Allie Irons from Hope, Florida. Nice to meet you, Strong said. Are you a native of Florida? Because I thought I picked up on a California accent. Allie's eyes widened in surprise, but the look quickly fled as she laughed and said, <laughs> Guilty as charged. I grew up in Southern California, but I got a job at a news station at Hope about five years ago. And when you're in a tough industry like news, you go where you're needed. Makes sense. Strong said. So do you travel the country to cover all sorts of news stories? Allie grinned. Yes, and I love it. It's the perfect job for me because I love helping people tell their stories almost as much as I love to travel. Sounds great. It is. Allie's eyes lit up and she leaned closer to Strong, lowering her, lowering her voice. I shouldn't tell you this, but the story I'm headed to LA for is huge. Have you heard about the danger DeWitt situation? Strong internally froze, but his years of training as a CIA operative made him an expert at hiding his feelings. Asking his true feelings, with a languid yawn, he nodded. Yeah, this morning I saw something about him on the news. He's missing, right? Yes. Ali's brown eyes were uh, bright with a mix of joy and mischief, as she said, that's why I'm headed to L.A., to score an interview with his wife. If I can get that, it'll put our little station on the map. And trust me, I'm going to get my one-on-one -on -one with her. I won't take no for an answer. Strong watched Allie carefully, noting the excitement in her stunning dark eyes and the determined set of her perfectly structured jawline. 
undoubtedly a beautiful woman like her was used to getting what she wanted, and that meant she wasn't going to give up until she scored her interview. Strong process is options. If he partnered with Allie, he might have an even better chance at getting, a, at getting to Mrs. DeWitt himself. He'd have to lie, but as an experienced CIA operative, he was accustomed to lying. Interesting, Strong said. Maybe it's kismet that we met because I'm a friend of dangers. Allie sat up straighter. You're kidding. Are you really? Strong nodded. Then we should definitely travel together. Allie clapped her hands, a look of sheer joy taking hold of her features. For a moment, her smile reminded Strong of April's. Trying to push April from his mind, he grinned back at Allie and said, Sure, why not? As the plane shifted, a golden ray of sunshine steamed, streamed through the window at Allie's left, setting a glowing spotlight on her exotic features. Under its glow, she smiled back at Strong, her warm brown eyes sparkling like firelight. This is going to be so much fun, she said in a honey-coated tone. They locked eyes and grinned at each other. Strong knew he'd made the right decision. <laughs> That's it. That was a good section. That was a good section. No, Thank I you. That. Thanks. I like writing um like silly stuff because you can be as over dramatic as you want. <laughs> so, but it's fun. It's but just it's fun. fun. <laughs> no, that was great. I enjoyed that. That was great. Thanks. It, yeah, it was. I like how you included everybody by put, making uh, splitting up the narration. Other than yourself, we, should, we needed to have you in there, but uh, that was fine. If we, if we do it again, just make sure you're part of it. To, if you want, it's totally up to you. It's your read, but uh, we certainly encourage you to be one of the readers. So okay. I'm going to Dave. Have you got my whole sheet that I set, sent you? Have you got set up in front of you there? Yeah. Do you mind going through? I don't know if you have to get ready at all. If you don't, uh, do you mind going through the beginning part and? Uh, I just need to step off screen for a second. Okay, you want me to do the, uh, the set the scene and the mention the characters? Yep, you can do that. Okay. Uh, sure. The the characters set the scene, and I will be back in about a minute and a half. What? He learned his lesson about the sticky tape. There was one time when he was in the <laughs> middle of changing, and it fell off. <laughs> it was hilarious. Oh okay, uh, so we're reading from uh, the book Into the Madness, and this uh, particular section is um, from the chapter entitled Pact with a Lunatic, or Pact with a Richard, whichever mm -hmm. you prefer. Um, so um, the cast of characters is, uh, the narrator is Christy, uh, a character called the Aberrator is Richard, who's a crazed necromancer. Al Alhina, who is me, a 150-year-old wizard who had recently shaved his head to disguise himself from the watchful eyes of head and misanthropes minions, and I can't believe that Richard actually forced me to shave my head for this reading. All now is uh, read by David Payne, a uh, half-giant, sim uh, a simpleton with a big heart, not David, I mean, Omar, the character. Uh, Sevilla is read by Paula, a cheeky, cocker, cocky, <laughs> cocky archer. And Lumina, another cheeky, but not as cocky archer. So the scene is that uh, Alhina has purposely led the others to a dangerous domain known as the Gulch a marshland that is overseen by a crazed necromancer known as the Aberrator. After a bloody skirmish with the denizens of the swamp, Alhemia summoned the Aberrator. Standing on the edge of the mist-covered waters of the splenic splash, Alina and his eclectic group awaits the necromancer's arrival. All right, so this is fantasy, and I apologize in advance for any mispronunciations. <laughs> David, said those, Dave, David said those names perfectly, so Splendid Splash and Aberrator. I think those are the only two that are going to give you trouble. Okay. I'm in my best narrator jacket. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Alhina spread his arms wide on the banks of the Splendid Splash, his staff's light barely cutting the fog. If he was wrong about who approached, they were in serious trouble. 
He swallowed. Even if he was right, there was no guarantee they would leave the gulch alive. The aberrator wasn't a well-balanced individual. Alhina liked to think of the man as unusual. Most people meeting the aberrator for the first time would lean toward lunatic. The third blast of the horn was so loud, Alhina flinched, but he remained <laughs> where he stood. <laughs> Splashing water preceded a most bizarre spectacle. Out of the fog, a lanky, barely clad, dark-skinned man held a long whisker in each hand to steady himself, his feet resisting on the gills of an elephant-sized catfish that whisked him across the water's surface. Alhina jumped out of the way as its body slid halfway onto the shore. The repulsive smell of what Alhina presumed to be the rotting carcass of the catfish turned up his nose. The aberrator's ride had long since died, but being a necromancer, the crazed overlord of the gulch never ran out of beasts to do his bidding. If they refused him while still alive, the aberrator had a remedy to induce their compliance, death. A wooden mask painted in outlandish colors covered the aberrator's face. He leapt spryly from the fish's back and landed noiselessly beside Alhina his head bobbing up and down, inspecting Alhina from a hair's breadth away. His head turned this way and that, emitting a strange tongue-clicking noise. He pulled a length of bamboo from his back and shook it. An eerie rattle escaped the tube. Alhina knew better than to move. If the aberrator thought for a moment that, that Alhina meant to harm him, his minions would descend upon the group. Pops, you okay? Omar's voice reached him, but he dared not respond. He was thankful to hear Sadira's sharp tongue. Shut up, lunkhead. He knows what he's doing. Alhina tried not to cringe when Sadira added, I hope. The aberrator plucked at Alhina's robes, sniffing them through nose holes carved into his hideous mask before bending to stare into Alhina's milky eyes. Ah, my, you return. Just like I predicted. You look old and terrible. I'm jealous. Who killed you? That's my job. <laughs> we proceed a <laughs> Alhina forced a smile for the unpredictable conjurer. No one killed me. I shaved my head to disguise myself. <laughs> the aberrator bent over double and slapped his thigh. You killed yourself, more like. He sprang into the air and confronted the startled faces of the others. Nice. You bring me pretty gifts. He shook his tube in the air, studying Pollard and Omar. I like them. Intimidating. He leapt over to Sidira, Rook, and Lorena, clicking his tongue and shaking his head. The others? Ah, fodder. Alhina strode up beside the aberrator. Uh -huh, I'm not so fast. They travel with me. The aberrator's mask pushed against Alhina's nose. To death? Alhina swallowed. Perhaps, but not here. We have an important mission to complete first. Ah, but you promised. I've been looking forward to your unhallowed sacrifice. A low growl escaped Omar. It's okay, Omar. Let me handle this. Alhina cautioned and placed an arm around the aberrator's back, steering him away. He glanced at Omar. You see? Friends. I know we like in the look of this, Pops. Omar growled, straining against Pollard's iron grip. Your giant has the right of it, Fazarus. I don't like what you're telling me, either. A shame the lurker isn't around anymore. That one's a tasty morsel. <laughs> The aberrator's high-pitched laugh made Alhina anxious. If he lost control of the unpredictable necromancer, Zephyr's fate would be sealed then and there. Last I saw of our scary friend, he was alive and well, lives up by the eternal land of frost and snow. Has his own tower, in fact. You, could, you should go see him. Alhina uh, said <laughs> as casually as he could. Your breath has settled down? Perhaps a visit is in his future. He would be my crown jewel. I might even trade you for him, huh? The aberrator's voice dropped to a whisper. Oh, that gives me an idea. Alhina swallowed. The aberrator's ideas were never good. 
Since you're too stubborn to die, I offer you this in exchange for the lives of your friends. Deliver to me the lurker, and I may even forego our personal accord. The aberrator shrugged free of Valhina's grasp and danced around like a lunatic, gyrating his bare hip and shaking his matted long black hair in a frenzy. An eerie wail escaped his lips. Ah, decide! Alhina stepped back to avoid being clubbed by the aberrator's rattle. Duel. The aberrator didn't seem to take notice. His gyrations spun him even close, ever closer to the group of bewildered quest members. Alhina raised his voice. If the necromancer got too close, Omar and Sadira would surely react. I agree. I will deliver the lurker. The aberrator stopped his frenetic dance just shy of Omar. He skipped back to Alhina. Really? You would do that? For poor old Abby? Alhina sighed. Aye, I know not how, but first my friends and I must tend to more important matters. More important than mine? Alhina raised thin brows. More pressing. He looked around. Speaking of which, the gulch does not seem to have suffered from Haladin's fire star. The aberrator straightened. His head tilted one way and then the other. He placed his mask against Alhina's nose. Do not insult me again. That trickster has no power here. Alhina swallowed but held firm. They remained face to face for a long while before the aberrator lifted his head high and laughed. Ah! Be gone with you, but do not be away too long or I will come for you, wizard of the north. Even if I have to tear down that anthill you call home. He held out his hand for Alhina to proceed up the eastern path. Actually, you have need to travel through the crypt. The aberrator jumped as if stung on the backside. He cackled and slapped his thigh, shaking his rattle over his head. The crypt! No one traveled the crypt. Not if they wish to be alive at the far end. That's not true. I have, if you recall. The aberrator nodded. Indeed. But you are Fazerist. They... He indicated the others with his rattle. Are... This is a condition I set for our call to be binding. In order to achieve my goal, I need these fine people alive. If you crave the lurker, that is my price. Once Haladin is dead, I will surrender myself to you. Pops, no! Omar roared, breaking free of Pollard. The aberrator's mask turned on Omar, his tubular staff rattling. Omar froze in mid-stride, one foot suspended in the air, and toppled helpless to the ground. Sidira and Lorena rushed to his side, while Rook pulled back an arrow and Pollard bounded forward. No! Alhina's staff flashed blue. A gust of wind held Pollard in check and dislodged Rook's arrow. The pulse of restraint was temporary, but it had its intended effect. Rook lowered his bow and Pollard stopped his advance beside the unmoving Olmar. It is the way it has to be. Do not provoke him further. Alhina turned to the aberrator. Do you agree? With the lurker? Yes, with the lurker. I agree. And you will keep the denizens of the crypt away from us? I do hate to rob them of such sport. The aberrator hung his head in mock defeat, his voice sounding like he pouted behind his mask. Very well. They will not touch you. Now hurry! I will prepare for your return. It will be many months before I can return with that cat and far more from return again. The aberrator bounded to the shoreline. It will take that much time to get ready. He hopped aboard his dead catfish, scooped up a whisker in each hand, and with a shake of his rattle, the atrocity wiggled backwards into a splenic splash. The catfish's mighty tail flicked over the water and spirited the necromancer away, his maniacal laughter fading into the mist. <laughs> Omar groaned and sat up with the assistance of Lorena and Sidira. He brushed dirt from the side of his head. Pops, you, can I be serious? I won't let you come back here. Alhina stared at the spot where the aberrator vanished. It wouldn't be long until he realized his fate anyway. Until then, he must see this through. 
Ridding the world of Heladin had been his life's mission. He sensed his group gathered around him, their gazes following his. What was that, that thing? Sidira asked, her slender arms wrapping him in an embrace from the side. Alhina tipped his head to lean against hers. That, my dear, is a space older than the hills. Time has robbed him of his faculties. But do not be fooled, the Arbiator possesses more noise than the combined archives of the chamber and the vaults of law below Castle Spelt. Sidira squeezed him hard. Well, don't you worry, Gramps. There ain't one of us that'll let old Rattleboy harm you. Alhina forced a smile. He didn't have the heart to tell her this next meeting with the Arbiator was a foregone conclusion. Nor was he prepared to listen to her drone on for days about how she wouldn't allow that to happen. He loved her spirit and was really quite envious of her innocent outlook on life, but he'd rather not argue about this predetermined fate. He broke free of her embrace and <clears throat> nodded to the rest, indicating with a hand gesture that they should start down the left fork. Give us a moment to gather our arrows, Sidira said, as she and Lorena and Rook went about the gruesome task of pulling shafts away from the bodies of their victims. When they had sorted the reclaimed arrows, Sidira grabbed Pollard's hand and skipped ahead to lead the way. Lorena and Olmar waited for Alhina and Rook to go ahead of them. Following the reedy shoreline, their surroundings were lost in the midst. So, Pops, what be this lurker thing the lunatic mentioned? Olmar asked, his footsteps clumping along behind. Ah, it is nothing to worry about. Just a wee beast living along the northern border of the Cradic Empire. That be all snow and ice up there. Aye, it is not a nice place to visit. So what is it, Mr. Evasive Pants? Lorena prodded. Nothing to concern yourself with. I will deal with it somehow when the time comes. Deal with it somehow? Sounds ominous. Come on, don't be like that. Is it a bear, a troll, a demon? What? Alhina muttered low and fast in resignation. A dragon. Nah. Lorena laughed. Sorry, I don't think I heard you right. It sounded like you said dragon. She stared at him incredulously when he didn't respond. You did say dragon. You're going to hunt a dragon and bring it back here? Lorena's voice was so loud that Pollard and Sidira stopped to stare. Alhina sighed. <sighs> Aye, and not just an ordinary dragon. This one is several hundred years old. As far as I know, he is the last remaining worm of his kind. Sidira laughed. Yeah, a worm? Oh, Gramps, you say the silliest things. Alhina shook his head. The last thing he wished was to capture such a wondrous creature. To bring it back for the aberrator to subjugate was wrong. And yet, the necromancer was clear. He would accept nothing less. Omar's voice interrupted his thoughts. And just how are you get you to be getting a beastie like that back down here? I was assuming it ain't to be pleased by the prospect. Well, I will fly it, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was an epic costume, Richard. <laughs> and we have it's a worm was. theme. I think we have a worm theme tonight. A little bit of worms. I'm glad your costume wasn't too accurate, Richard. <laughs> that was really, that was really fun. And we had like Richard. That was like a, a whole bunch of your characters in one story, which was really cool to see. Yeah, they mm -hmm. when that group travels together, they're uh, they, they always carry on. The 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 two archers are always bugging Olmar, always picking on him, and uh, he's just a big. They call him the big lunkhead, and but. You know, when when uh, when trouble uh, happens, uh, they get behind Omar because Omar is a force to be reckoned with. Nice, very nice. That was great, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, we had a great time. Thank you so much for coming and for reading all of this. It was just fantastic. It was great reading your stuff too. Such different, all different works. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, everybody. So, just before we sign off, uh, does anyone have any imminent releases or what's what's next for you, Paula? You got something coming up soon? And where can we find your books? She might be frozen. Yeah, I think Paula's got a time delay there. Oh, 
I, I can hear you. I don't know if you all can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. We're just wondering what's next for Paula and uh, where can everybody find your books? Well, um, I'll just I'll talk and hopefully it'll work. Okay. I did. Um, if you, well, I guess I can give you my, my um, author, Paula L. Jones <laughs> dot Weebly. And that's where I have all my books. Or you can just go on Amazon and look for Paula L. Jones. That's probably a lot easier. Um, but I did just release a book today. It's about how to oh, self publish a book. Excellent. Good for you. That's awesome. Thanks. How about you, David Payne? Uh, Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. Okay. We, we appreciate you coming. So how about you, David Payne? Uh, what's next for you and uh, where can we find your books? Well, uh, so none of my books are published yet. Uh, I did just have an acceptance this morning. I'm not sure exactly how much I'm allowed to share about it, but uh, okay, yeah. it should be, should be coming, out, coming out in the spring. Um, but more importantly, I have a, an interview with a special author this Thursday uh, on my Twitch channel, which will be uh, twitch.tv slash Artho. Um, I'll be interviewing uh, one Christy. So, uh, wow, she's a hard one to land. Yeah, we've been trying to get her on for a long time. <laughs> her so, handlers normally get back to us and say, "Yeah, she's too busy for us." <laughs> but I mean, otherwise, uh, I'm doing writing every day. Uh, I stream at six thirty to eight thirty, Monday through Friday in the morning Easter time, Eastern time. Um, and then I have evening and weekend streams as I, as time allows, but I'm just writing up a storm and doing, doing the thing. Awesome. Well, congratulations and good luck with your writing going forward. And, uh, so, but, did, you, did you say that you stream your writing live? I do. It even shows it on the screen actually. Oh my God. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't read fast enough for that. That's like David. No. <laughs> No, <laughs> I don't mean to give everybody, uh, I don't know, seizures about this. It, it really is not that bad. It's a lot of fun. I, I, I'll do that once in a while. I do my live reads on Thursday. I'm moving my live edit, but I don't generally have my uh, thing on there because uh, I don't think I write quick enough when I'm doing the edits. But uh, anyway, thank you, Paul and uh, David, for joining us again this week. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you uh, participating in our live read. Uh, this is our favorite episode of the month. Uh, Christy and uh, David Kelly, we really look forward to doing these and we appreciate uh, you guys coming in and sharing your stories with us. Yeah, thank thank you. You. So thank next you. week on Looking for Legends, we'll be chatting with Jay Lynn Els, an author who writes fantasy, sci-fi, and historical fiction. Jay Lynn is an award-winning author from Minnesota with two historical fiction novels set in ancient Egypt, and they're called The Forgotten, Aston's Last Queen, and uh, it was named as Indie Editor's Choice Book for 2016. By the Historical Novel Society, and uh, the second book's Forgotten Heir, the Forgotten Heir of the Heretic, as well as the sci-fi novella Strangely Constructed Souls. She has also authored an Arthurian-influenced female-driven fantasy trilogy. Jaylin believes in unicorns and random acts of kindness. So, should be a very interesting show next week. So, I hope you uh, you can all join us then, and uh, uh, maybe we can talk Jaylin into uh, a, a book giveaway as well. So. He, about partake in that. So thanks again for joining us tonight. For Christy, Paula, Dave, David, and myself, we wish you a wonderful week ahead. Good night. Until we meet again, take good care, everybody. <laughs>